Well, we've been going through this uh, series, uh, going through Genesis, really an overview of Genesis, uh, highlighting kind of the big stories, the big turning points in Genesis, looking specifically at uh, where we can find the gospel in the Old Testament and here actually in Genesis. Uh, we've been wanting to really look and see and show that uh, the Bible is not made up of the good news and the bad news, the, uh, the Old Testament God, the New Testament God, uh, the law, and then grace. But we're actually seeing that the Bible is one book, one message from beginning to end. It's the story of uh, God's redemption of mankind and God bringing glory to himself through uh, the gospel, the good news. Uh, that God, though a just and holy God, who really does, as we're going to see today, really hates sin. Uh, but yet he's also a God of mercy and kindness and love. And uh, so today we find ourselves, we're backtracking a little bit, as I mentioned a few weeks ago. Uh, we're going to be looking at the story of Noah. And we, we backtracked because the movie came out uh, last night. I know some of you guys saw it last night. And, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about, about that. But uh, what we're doing is we're, we're kind of going backwards now. Last week we looked at the story of, uh, of Abraham. Uh, but the story of Noah is really kind of the second major story after Adam and Eve and then Cain and Abel. Uh, and, and even before um, the, uh, the Tower of Babel. And uh, so we're going to go kind of back, and we're going to look at this story, and we're going to um, see what God has to speak to us and show us about uh, what his intention is, even in destroying the earth through a flood. Uh, what was happening up until then, and what was his whole purpose? Uh, and I'll tell you this, is that the story of Noah has been... Uh, told wrongly for years. And so this, this new movie isn't the first time the story has been told wrong. Uh, I can almost guarantee you every single children's Bible you have has something wrong about the story of Noah. Usually it goes something like this, that everyone on the earth was bad, except Noah was a good guy. And because Noah is a good guy, then God decided to save him. Well, that's not true. That's not the gospel. That's not how you get saved. That is not how God chooses people based on our merit or our good works or how good we are. Uh, and, but that's usually always the way every single children's Bible tells the story. So therefore, if you're a good person, then God will spare you. But that's not what the Bible teaches. It teaches that nowhere, including the story of Noah. So even in going to this movie last night, and I promise I won't give any spoilers, uh, but um, except that there's a, a big boat and there's like a lot of water and stuff and m almost everyone dies. But, uh, but outside of that, I won't give any spoilers away. Um, but I will say this, that uh, it, it was, I, I knew it would depart from the biblical story, but I didn't think it would depart as much as it did. I mean, it would, like went like... It almost just didn't look like a Bible story. It was kind of like, uh, you know, the Titanic meets Lord of the Rings meets Transformers. I mean, it was just kind of a, kind of a cinematic mess, really. Uh, but, um, but there were some interesting things and some great visuals that really did give a, uh, a, a decent picture in some ways of what some of the things may have been like. I definitely think that the story was way more, uh, the way they depicted it as being so gritty uh, and ominous. I think they did a better job than the children's Bibles do with like the giraffes popping their heads out of the top of a boat and everyone's smiling because they got saved. And I mean, I don't think that's very accurate either. Uh, so, but, but all that to say is that uh, there was a, a lot of departure. Uh, it'd be one of those things where, you know, if you wait for it to come on DVD, I mean, watch it, but have your Bible open and, and take lots of notes. Uh, but as we go through today, I'll, I'll point out um, primarily really what the real story is. And I might make some comments here and there. Um, so if you go see the movie, uh, you'll kind of know what to look for, again, without giving spoilers. So, uh, but let's, uh, let's pray first, and then we're going to jump into Genesis chapter 6. Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, bringing us here today. We thank you for all the great things that you're doing in our church family. Uh, we thank you for the, um, the blessing that you've uh, enabled us to be a blessing to others. Uh, Jose Luis and Cindy down in Mexico, uh, Ted and Judy over in Zambia. Uh, we're, we're grateful, Lord, that, uh, that as we're blessed, we can be this blessing. As we've been seeing, uh, even in the scriptures the last few weeks, uh, that as your people, this is what you've called us to do and to be. Uh, that you have uh, blessed us so we can bless others. And, and not just uh, even speaking materially, but God, you've blessed us with adoption. You've adopted us as sons and daughters. You've given us grace. You've shown us 
who you are and that you're a God of mercy and grace, willing to forgive, willing to adopt. And because of that, Lord, because you bestowed that upon us, and now you call us your sons and daughters, now we take that blessing, that blessing of the gospel, that blessing of truth, and we say, Lord, we, we want to uh, bring that everywhere that we go, from our workplaces and our homes and our schools uh, to distant places. So God, help us to, uh, as, as we saw last week in the story of Abraham, help us to become part of that fulfillment of being a blessing to all nations. And even as this story, the story of Noah is going to show us too, your desire to, to fill the earth with truth and ultimately to bring redemption to fallen mankind. So Lord, we thank you so much and we love you. We ask that you would open our eyes, our, our minds, our hearts, our ears now to the truth of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's open up to Genesis chapter 6. And again, we're going to be doing uh, kind of an overview because there's uh, three chapters, uh, actually kind of three and a half chapters given to the story of Noah, so we won't be able to go through every single detail, but uh, we're just going to look at the big picture uh, of, of the gospel and, and the good news that is in this story here. So we're going to start here uh, in chapter 6, verse 5. It says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now think about this for a second. Okay, this is not many generations, about eight, nine generations from Adam. That's not very, that's not very long. But by this time, and we were this close to the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve, and Eve were, were sinless. And yet by now already, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every intention, every intention, every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only, 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 only evil continually, nonstop. That's, that's a big, big statement to, to wrap our, our minds around and, and get a picture of. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. Sin grieves God. It, he, when he sees what sin does to his image bearers, that it shatters the image of God. You know, we're like, uh, Calvin said that we're like mirrors and we reflect the image of God, but sin comes in and throws a stone at that, at that image and shatters us. Now, now we're this mirror that's on the ground and we still reflect the image of God to some degree. You know, we still have, uh, we, we still have uh, moral responsibility. We have uh, the cap capability of love. We have lots of things, but this image is now shattered and deformed. So it's, it's still there. We're still made in God's image for sure, but it's distorted and it's marred. And only the work of the Holy Spirit can pick up those pieces and put it back together again. Try as we may, we can start putting all the pieces, but there's so many pieces, there's no way we could put that jigsaw back together, that jigsaw puzzle back together again. And so here we are, uh, we're made in God's image, but he is sorrowful and grieved in his heart because of where we've gone with our sin. And the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I'm sorry that I've made them. But here's the key verse here. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found favor. Now I want you to know that this word favor is the same word that the Bible uses as grace. Noah found a gift. He found grace. He was given a gift. This is not something that Noah earned. Uh, this is not something that Noah worked hard for and God said, well, there's a good man. Maybe, maybe mankind's worth saving because, you know, Noah's, Noah's got goodness in his heart. Now, see, it says that everyone had evil continually, and that included Noah. Noah was a sinful man. Uh, Noah, given to his own ways, he sought after himself just like everybody else. But he found a gift. He found grace. God gave him grace. And so Noah was saved the same way that you and I are saved, by grace, through faith. Not of ourselves, 
but it's the gift of God is what Ephesians 2 says. Okay, we're saved by grace through faith. Now, in, in Hebrews eleven six, 6, it says this. Uh, this is talking about Noah and talking about the Old Testament uh, heroes of the faith. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. So, so Noah could not have earned this favor unless it first started with faith. Okay, so this was not earned by his goodness or him working hard so that he can earn a spot on the boat. One of the interviews I read uh, with uh, Darren Aronofsky, the guy who directed the, the Noah movie, he said, you know, as a kid, he'd read the story and he'd always wonder, gosh, would I have been good enough to get on the boat? And that's kind of like where he's coming from with the movie. And, and the simple answer is no. None of us would have been good enough to get on the boat and neither was Noah. Noah was not good enough to get on the boat. His family was not good enough to get on the boat. But Noah found grace and favor in the eyes of the Lord. God, because of God's own kindness, because of God's own mercy, because of God's own love, this is why he decided to save and spare Noah and have him build this ark rather than truly actually destroying everything. So Hebrews eleven six. 6, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists, that he must believe that God exists and he rewards those who seek him. And by faith, Noah, by faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen. So God warned Noah that this flood would happen. And in reverent fear, he constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness. But here's the key that comes by faith. Not by works, not by religiosity, not by going to church all the time, not by stopping drinking, not by stopping from cursing, not from doing all those things, not from trying to earn that spot. That's not what gains entrance into the kingdom of God. It's a gift. And so the Old Testament saints have been saved the same way as us, by God's grace, through faith, by finding favor in God's sight by him giving us a gift and when we get this gift then we now have faith in God. This is how it's always been and this is how it's always going to be. Uh, we are not basically good people. All right, any of you guys who have ever had a one year old? You don't have to teach your kids to sin, do you? How many of you guys have taught your sin? Like, I'm gonna teach my kids to sin today. How many, anyone, no one, no? They kind of do it on their own, don't they? Uh, left to ourselves, we go our own way. This is what Isaiah 53 says, that, that we're like sheep without a shepherd and, and we go our own way. We become lost sheep. We're very good at it. it. It's built into us. We have this original sin. We have this hereditary disease that Adam passed down to us. This is just part of being human. In Psalm 51.5, it says this, Behold... This is the psalmist saying, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, in sin. I was born in sin, and in sin did my mother conceive me. See, and what we do is we think that uh, we want to be independent of God. We want to do our own thing and say, uh, we want to earn our own self-righteousness, and we want to become good people apart from God, just like we saw with the Tower of Babel a couple weeks ago. We want to do our own thing and make a name for ourselves, but that independence from God is the enemy of dependence on God. In Romans chapter three, it says this, verse nine. You can go here, it's a few verses. Romans three, verse nine. It'll be up on the screen as well. It says this, so what then? Are, are Jews any better off? Now, this is a, a big question here. One that we saw actually last week with the story of, of Abraham and one actually that the, the movie did uh, address. Uh, at first in the movie, they're kind of making it seem like uh, people are saying, well, God, God chose you, Noah. The family is saying, God chose you, Noah, because you're a good man. And at first in the beginning of the movie, they're kind of making it seem that way and that all these other men were evil and but Noah was good. And I'm sitting here going like, ah, that's not true. Noah's just as sinful and just as guilty. He doesn't deserve to be on the ark either. A little bit later in the movie, Noah has this little revelation. He goes, no, uh, it's, it's us too. We don't deserve to be here either. And I was sitting there going like, oh, that was actually accurate. Now, his, uh, where he went with that thought was really wrong in the movie. You'll, you'll see it if you, if you do see it. Uh, but he came to this conclusion where he realized himself, I don't deserve to be on this ark. I shouldn't be here. My family, who I love, he's looking at his wife, who he loves, his kids, who he loves. We shouldn't be here. 
We don't deserve to be on this ark any more than the people out there that are now dying. We're just as much part of the problem. And so for us as believers, now we've, for those of you guys who know Christ, you've been saved. But you got to know that when you look out into the world, you look out at some of your friends, your family, your relatives, and sometimes we look down upon them. We scoff at them. Oh, look at them and the way they're living their lives. Oh my gosh. But you, you need to realize every single day, you don't deserve to be where you're at. If, if Christ has saved you, it's because of his grace. It's because he had mercy on you. You, you don't deserve a single bit of the salvation that you've been given. I don't, you don't, and, and it's true, they don't either. And this is why we lift up the name of Jesus and say thank you Lord Jesus that you are a God of grace, that you've shown it to me and now because you've blessed me I wanna be a blessing to others and tell others about the grace that they can have to save them. Rather than looking down upon and having uh, this, this uh, downward view, you say, I, I want to be a blessing to them. I want them to know the same grace that has saved me. And so this is where we, we look at this question now uh, what, that Paul's asking in Romans 3. What then, are the Jews any better off? Now he's comparing Jews and Gentiles. So are, are the Jews, did God choose the Jews because they were more special and because they were better and because they tried to obey the law? And we saw this last week with the story of Abraham, that that's not the case. Okay, that, that God doesn't show favor. That there's, there's nothing that makes you more special if you're from the natural descendant of Abraham, but God saves by grace through faith. And so here's what Paul says, no, not at all. You're not more special if you're born Jewish. You're not more special just because you're Noah and his family. You're not more special if you're born into a Christian home. You're not even more special now that you're even a, a, a Christian. You are just as much a sinful person saved by grace. No, not at all. We have all already charged this, that both Jews and Greeks, Gentiles, that's another word for Gentiles, both of them are under sin. We're all sinful. None of us are better off as it's written. None is righteous. No, not one. No one is righteous. That included Noah. No one understands, no one seeks for God. We're all like sheep going astray, going after our own thing. We don't have to be taught how to sin. We will do it on our own. We'll be just fine pursuing sin on our own with no guidance. We don't seek for God, we seek ourselves. All have turned aside. We've all gone our own way. Together, everyone, we've all become worthless. We've become shattered mirrors on the ground. No one does good. No, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. We like to lie. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. And their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. We have bitterness in our hearts. We have anger that comes out of our lips. We lie. We cheat. We steal. We deceive. We manipulate. We're always looking out for number one, which is us. We, we make excuses for our sin. We like to blame other people. We like to avoid responsibility. I mean, these are things that we do on a daily basis. But yet, we're really good at minimizing our sin and comparing ourselves to the other people. But before God, none of us are good. Not compared to God. Uh, our, even our good deeds, our righteous deeds are like filthy rags to God. You know, that's the part that scares me the most about my own sin. It's not so much how much God hates my sin, but it's how much that my righteous deeds don't even compare to God's righteous deeds. But man, even me on like a good day, I don't live up. I don't even come close to living up. And in verse 18, there's no fear of God before their eyes. At the end of the day, we don't fear God, we want to be God. We have no fear that we're actually challenging God. And then if you skip down to verse 23, it says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. A few chapters later in Romans 7, uh, Paul talks about uh, himself and he's saying, uh, I know that in me, in myself, me apart from Christ, in me, nothing good dwells. I'm, I'm sinful through and through. Apart from the saving work of Christ and the Holy Spirit indwelling inside me, nothing good dwells in me. I, I want to do the right thing, but I don't have the strength to do it. 
See, this is what we say that we as human beings, we are depraved. We are sinful through and through. And so this is the problem. And this is what grieved God in his heart and made him sorrowful, brokenhearted. And he saw what we have done to ourselves. We now murder each other, whether in our hearts through anger or even actually outwardly. So God here, going back to Genesis, will be in uh, chapter 6 again. God is about to judge sin on the earth. So chapter 6, verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence, and God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Again, all flesh had done this. All flesh had been corrupted by sin. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So make yourself an ark of gopher wood. God is serious about sin. And not just on a global scale, not just the big atrocities, but your sin and my sin, he's serious about. When we sin, it's a direct attack upon God, our maker, our creator, our father. He's very serious about sin, but here's the, the, the good news. This is the beginning of seeing the good news because so far we've just had bad news here. The good news is that God is going to provide a way out. Now, only God could do this. Only God could give these directions, these instructions to Noah, and only God is the one who can even enable this thing to actually work. So let's see what God's plan is here. Verse 14, make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch, which is like a tarry substance. This is how you're to make it. The length of the uh, ark is 300 cubits. Its breadth is 50 cubits. Its height is 30. Make a roof of the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark on its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I'll bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that's on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you'll come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you, and of every living thing of all flesh. You shall bring two of every sort into the, into the ark to keep them alive with you. They'll be male and female, of, of all the birds according to their kinds, the animals according to their kind, of each creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come uh, into you to keep them alive. And take with you every sort of food that is eaten, and store it up. You've got to feed these things, right? Store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this, and he did all that the Lord commanded him. Now, when we get this, this picture here of God sparing mankind, you, you kind of wonder, uh, we, we ask this question a lot, why doesn't God save more people? Why doesn't he save everyone? And then now when you look at what mankind has done by corrupting everything, we, we kill each other. We, we fill the earth with corruption. You, now you start wondering, well, why did God save anyone at all? And, and that's the real question we should ask ourselves because sometimes we, we get this idea like God owes us. But when you see what happens when God lets us go our way, you, you sit there and you wonder, God, why did you save humankind? Why did you? But God's desire in saving humankind was that he would be glorified, that he would show that despite the sinfulness of man, he can redeem, he can save, he can show mercy, he can change lives. And he's going to do this. And he's come up with this plan for Noah to, to work out, is to build this ark. Now, I wanted to show you guys uh, some, just some stats, because I know stats are kind of fun sometimes. You can look at this uh, uh, in your notes here. Just physically speaking, realistically speaking, is this thing even feasible? Because a lot of people, they say, oh, it's just a fable. There's no way this could happen. But I want to show you a few of these stats here. First of all, the dimensions of the ark, uh, they, they, they jive with current and modern shipbuilding ratios, six to one. That's like the ideal uh, length and, and uh, uh, width that you would make a ship is six to one, very seaworthy. Uh, this had a displacement of 20,000 tons with 14,000 gross tonnage of cargo. 
Okay, so it could hold a lot. There was a San Diego hydraulic company that actually did tests. They built a, a model of this, and they figured out that it could withstand up to 200 uh, foot waves, and that when it comes to hydrodynamics, there's almost, it'd be virtually impossible to capsize this vessel if they built this thing. Had 101,000 square feet with 1.4 million cubic feet of space, which was equivalent to 522 uh, 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 train cattle cars. Okay, so we see the, the train goes by, 522 train cars. Okay, and I actually, uh, when I first did this research years ago, uh, I actually did the math myself just to make sure it was pretty, and it was actually close. <laughs> I was like, I went online, I found out how big a cattle car is, and I just wanted to, because you never want to just take someone's word for it, you know? So I did the math. Uh, each, so each uh, trained cattle car could fit 240 sheep-sized animals. So that'd be 125,000 sheep. That's a lot of sheep. So only 188 cars would actually be needed out of the 522 in order to carry 45,000 sheep-sized animals. And that number is taken because there's about 17,600 different species uh, of, of animals today. Okay, so if you double that, right, two by two, you'd get, you know, 35,200. All right, so that's a good number, 45,000. You only need 188 train cars. It's a plausible estimate with more room to spare. Uh, the average animal is the size of a small rat. So even doing a sheep size, you're already you know, kind of overcompensating. Average, isn't that weird? Average animal is the size of a small rat. Like, there's no way, but you figure, well, you don't see the other ones that are on the other side, you know, so it kind of makes sense. So the average animal is the size of a rat and only 11% of all animals are larger than a sheep. Okay, so when you're thinking, because you, we always have the big question, like, what about the elephants, you know, or whatever, uh, but they are in the very small minority of large animals. Most of the animals are very small. Plus, they would take on probably babies and the, the younger ones that are smaller. It's been estimated that food, probably in the form of hay, dried fruits, vegetables, dried fish, could have been stored in about 12% of the floor space, uh, and about uh, 10% or 11%, 10% would be used for uh, water, for drinking water. And of course they could, I mean, I think they had plenty of rainwater to, to pick from too. Uh, they could have uh, used that. The maximum weight was 48 million pounds, but it would be buoyant, only half the arc would be submerged in the water. So it was very seaworthy. Uh, the center of gravity would have been very, at the geometric center of the arc. Now here's the interesting stuff, and this is what is really fascinating to me. There's been widely distributed fossils in regions where it doesn't make sense. So, for instance, you know they found lots of palm trees underneath uh, the ice in Antarctica? Kind of weird spot for palm trees. They found um, woolly mammoths, for instance, with tropical vegetation in their stomachs. Uh, so those animals lived in a, a much more uh, tropical environment than maybe we would have thought before. Uh, they found whale bones in the top of the Himalayas mountains, as high as we can hike and also on the top of the Andes Mountains. They found oysters, oysters in the top of the Andes Mountains, kind of a strange spot. Uh, they found all kinds of marine fossils in some of the highest mountain peaks, showing, proving that at one point, these things were underwater, the highest mountains. And they have all these different uh, fossils from all over the world. Uh, some also in the United States, in um, uh, Lake Ontario, Vermont, Montreal, Canada. Uh, in the south of England, there was hundreds of bones that were covered in silt that would have necessitated that a thousand feet of water would have been there to form that type of silt. Uh, Salt Lake City in Utah uh, shows lots of uh, signs and findings that at one point there was an ocean there, not just a salty big lake. Uh, the American Museum of Natural Science, uh, this is an article in the New York Times, uh, they showed that in the lowest parts of the earth, there was also other uh, oceans uh, that were in parts of North America. Uh, beds of sand in the middle of the Atlantic that's only found on seashores. So at some point, uh, these were actually shores, but now they've been covered. Uh, so you see all these uh, different uh, archaeological facts, scientific facts that point to this, uh, this truth that this is a real event that happened. Uh, the ark itself was very seaworthy. Uh, it was, I mean, that six to one ratio that they, that was built on was something that shipbuilders didn't start doing until much later, but somehow uh, no one knew this would be a great ratio. Well, it's because the architect was God and God knew, well, here's a, here's a good ratio for, for building a, a seaworthy ship. So now let's go back into the story here. Uh, Genesis 6.
Actually, we're going to go into um, Genesis 7, verse 1. The next, say, uh, 24 verses gives us kind of a chronology of what this flood was like, what happened, uh, what was going on, how long they had to wait, all these things. And rather than reading through all these, I wanted to show you this little structure here. It's called a chiastic structure. Uh, this is, uh, you see this little kind of, uh, you know, uh, indented uh, paragraph looking chart here. In ancient literature, uh, particularly in Genesis and some other um, non-biblical writings, uh, this, this was used a lot. It's called a chiastic structure. And what it is, is it's when authors, uh, kind of in almost a poetic way, uh, they structure their story uh, in a way to point to a central event. And so you see this in Genesis uh, at least a few times. Uh, and I didn't bring them up in our previous sermons, but I wanted to in this one here uh, because it's so important to see what is God trying to show us? What's his main point? What does he want us to take away from this particular story? And so when God set up these timetables and he had them wait for seven days and there was 40 days of rain, these weren't just arbitrary numbers, but he structured it in a way to show us something. So leading up to Genesis chapter 8, verse 1, we see that God is deconstructing creation. But after Genesis 8, 1, we see that God is reconstructing creation. And you see these parallels that are going to point to one central event. So we'll go through here, uh, going through this chiastic structure here. First of all, in the letter A, we see the violence in God's creation. Then we see his first divine address, which is his resolution to destroy. I'm going to destroy the earth. Then we see his second divine address, a command to enter into the ark, telling the family. Then we see 40 days of the beginning of the flood, 40 days of rain. Then there's 150 days of the prevailing floodwaters, which is mentioned in uh, chapter 7, verse 24. It says that for 150 days, the floodwaters prevailed on the earth. But then in chapter 8, verse 1, says this amazing statement, but God remembered Noah. Now this isn't, the, at first reading you go, this is kind of a weird statement. You, you kind of picture yourself like when you wake up and you're in high school and you wake up and you realize that science project was due that day. You go, oh no, science project due today. It's not like that. It wasn't like God was just hanging out, drinking tea in heaven. And then he's like, oh, oh, Noah, what? I forgot about Noah. It's like, it wasn't like he just remembered Noah all of a sudden. But what this is saying here is that God was watching these events uh, unfold and he had this grief in his heart over the sin of man. But that he turned his mind, his heart, his eyes towards Noah and he's set in his heart, Noah, I will save you. I will spare you though you don't deserve it, though your family does not deserve it. I will remember you because you are mine. Because you're my adopted son, despite everything going on in your life, what this shows us, personally, individually as well, is that God will remember you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He won't forget you. He's not gonna leave you hanging out to dry. And it doesn't matter what is going on around you in your life. God will remember you. He will keep you. He will sustain you until the end. He will be faithful even when you're not faithful. If you're his adopted son or daughter, he will remember you. This is the turning point of the story. This is the turning point of us seeing the gospel here in this flood story. Is that though God will destroy and he is serious about sin. He is serious about your sin. And he will do whatever it takes to take you through calamity and hardship and even suffering in order to get at your sin. He wants your sin gone. And he will take you through hard times. And he will bring about refining moments in your life in order to get at the core of you and purge you from sin. He wants that sin eradicated. But he'll always remember you. He'll always keep you. He'll always love you and shelter you. He'll always be your good shepherd. And then from this point in, in Genesis 8, 1, we see this, this uh, start to, to change now. We're going to see God reconstructing creation. Now, instead of 150 days of prevailing flood waters, we see in 8, 3 that there's 150 days of receding flood waters. 
Instead of 40 days at the beginning of the flood and, and the rain coming down, now we're seeing 40 days of the drawing of, of, the, drawing of the earth in 8.6. Now we're going to see the third divine address, the command to leave the ark. Rather than to go into the ark, now we're leaving the ark. Now it's his resolution to preserve order. Rather than his, uh, his resolution to destroy, he's now making a resolution to preserve order. And then in chapter 9, verse 1 through 17, his fourth divine address, now it's his covenant blessing and peace. So we start off with talking about all the violence. But now God has a divine address speaking of his covenant blessing and his peace. And then in Genesis 9, 7, we see this very interesting uh, statement that God makes. It says, God says to Adam, I've made man in my own image. It's only the second time we see this in the Bible. The first time was Adam and Eve. But he reminds Noah, because see, Noah is, is like a type of Adam. He's a second Adam. He he's, has different similarities with Adam. Uh, both Adam and Noah says they walked with God. Both were said to be made in, in man's image. Uh, they both had three sons who had varying paths. One who was blessed. Uh, one that was cursed. Uh, both of their worlds were made out of a watery chaos. If you read in Genesis 1. And now also in Genesis 6. Both exercised some type of dominion over animals. Noah, uh, Adam got to name all the animals. And he was told to subdue the earth. Noah now has, uh, is called to protect the, the animals and bring them into the ark and now give them a, a second uh, world to live in. Uh, both of them sin by way of food. At, uh, Adam and Eve eat from the, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, after Noah gets off the ark, the first thing he does is he goes and he gets drunk. Right, you see that in Genesis 9. And, uh, and so he sins. And so you see all these similarities that Noah is a second Adam, but even Noah though, and this is the point of showing us that no matter what, even righteous Noah, the first thing he did, well, the first thing he did was he actually worshiped the Lord, which was good. He built an altar and then he was found drunk and naked later. So even when God gets rid of all the wickedness on the earth and, and there's this man and his family that have found grace in God's sight, even then we're still sinful people. We still fall short. Even Noah, starting from scratch, we, we still go towards sin. And so this picture shows us once again, we need someone greater than Adam. We need someone greater than Noah. Noah can't save us. He can save us from a temporal destruction, but he cannot save us from eternal punishment. He's not good enough. He's not pure enough. We need a true second Adam. Because Noah could not do it. But then God says this also in Genesis 9, 7. He says, God made, he goes, I made man in my image. And he says to Noah and his family, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. This is God's desire from day one. And for us as a church, it's still his desire. He wants us to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Not just physically having babies, but spiritually sharing and preaching the gospel, being a blessing to all nations, sharing the gospel with people that don't know Jesus so they can be born spiritually. This is our task as fulfilling this command. Uh, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, Jesus says this, For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. That in the future, Jesus says, it's going to get this bad. Where all we want is sin and evil. It's going to become like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So it will also be the coming of the Son of Man. So when Christ comes back, there's going to be all kinds of chaos Two men will be standing in a field, one will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, one will be left. When Christ comes back, there is going to be a uh, divide. There will be a battle. Christ will come back in his glory to do war against sin once again. He won't destroy it by flood, but what Peter tells us, the apostle, he tells us it's going to be by fire. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, 
If God didn't spare the angels when they sinned, and he didn't, he didn't spare the angels, he judged them for their sin. But instead he cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment. And if he didn't spare the ancient world, but he preserved Noah, who was a herald, a preacher of righteousness, Noah was a preaching man. Along with seven others, his family, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. So he's saying, God is serious about sin. So if God's that serious about sin, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them by ex to extinction, making them an example of what's going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, so he, he, he helped Lot come out of Sodom and Gomorrah, who was greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, uh, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. So if God is able to rescue Lot, he's able to rescue Noah, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. God will remember you. He won't leave you or forsake you. And he knows how to keep the unrighteous under punishment till the day of judgment. As we close, I'll have you open to Revelation chapter 19. Be in verse 11 here. This is the future that Jesus had just spoke about and saying, when I come back, here's what it's going to be like. It's going to be like the days of Noah. People will be doing their own thing and we'll be persecuted. We'll, we'll suffer consequences for some of these things. Uh, will be hopefully a blessing to the nations as all this happens. Uh, but in that desire to be a blessing, we'll be mocked, we'll be scoffed just as Christ was. But Jesus says, if I know how to uh, punish the, the wicked world in the days of Noah, if I didn't have mercy on the angels, but I showed them judgment, but yet I rescued Lot, I rescued uh, 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 Lot and Noah, if I can do that, then I will remember you as well. So even though the days in, in coming will get harder and harder for us as believers, uh, here's the future that we have to look forward to. Revelation 19, verse 11. I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on the horse is called Faithful and True. This is Jesus. And in righteousness, he judges and he makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. And he's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. He is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. Guess who that is? That's us. All right, we've been adopted, and now we become part of this, this army of heaven in the future. The armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, despite our sin, God remembers us. And he takes our sin upon the cross, and he does away with it. And then he clothes us in his righteousness. And now we are arrayed in this fine linen, white and pure, covered in the blood of Christ. All of our sin washed away. We become the righteousness of Christ. Though we don't deserve it, we don't deserve to be on that ark. The new ark being Jesus. He now is the ark who saves and when we enter into Christ, when we become in Christ, then we're saved from judgment. And the, the watery grave around us does not affect us. We're saved from this judgment. We're following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he'll rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. And with a loud voice, he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, come gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. 
And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with the armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. So the enemy, Satan, is gathering together all the people of the earth who oppose God, who oppose truth, and they're about to make war. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done many signs and wonders, which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. But these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. See, that, that sword that comes out of the mouth, what we see in Ephesians 6 that we call the, the Bible the sword of the Spirit. And so what this is saying is God doesn't have to fight a physical war. He's not going to battle with this big old sword and slaying people. All he does is speaks the word. That's how powerful he is. He just speaks. He says, you are condemned. Be gone. And just with a word, God does away with all evil. Wipes out all evil. And puts them in the lake of fire forevermore. Came out of the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh. And for us today, as we uh, close this morning, we step back and we say, we look around at this world and we say, God, this, this world rejects you. Help us to be a blessing that we would bless our enemies by preaching the good news to them, by sharing our life with them, by sharing the good news with them, telling them about a God who can save, but also a God who will judge. A God who is serious about sin, but is willing to forgive. And this is the great story of this, this flood and God preserving Noah so that through Noah's line, through his son Shem, would eventually be born Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who would uh, redeem all of us that he would be the true second and also last Adam that we need. That though we prove over and over that man will fail and fail and fail, even the most amazing, faithful man of God will fail us, but eventually through Noah's line, through Shem's line, will come Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the last Adam, the one who can fulfill all of God's law, all of God's commands, and invite us to trade with him our sin for his righteousness. It's an amazing, amazing thing. Father God, I, I just, I come to you, Lord, and firstly, I confess that, that I know I don't deserve anything that you've given me. I don't deserve the grace that you've given me. You've, you've called me, you've shown me favor and grace, you've saved me from my sin and invited me to enter into the, the true and living ark, which is your son Jesus. And God, I am asking, Lord, that you would help me to have the same uh, attitude of seriousness towards my sin that you do, that as I read through this story, uh, it, it awakens me and makes me thankful that though you are so serious about my sin, you also will never forget me. You will always be my God and I will always be your son. That you will rescue me out of any trial and hardship, even if it's not the way I would like it to be, but I know that you will. You will remember me as you remembered Noah and you remembered Lot. I pray that this morning as you guys are meditating before the Lord that whatever trial is in your life, you would hang on to that promise today. That he is your God. If he's shown you grace, if you've been saved by the blood of Christ, he will forever always be your God. And if you don't know the love of Christ, you don't know the mercy of God, you need to know that God is serious about your sin. That he is anguished over your sin. 
and he will judge because of your sin. But he has given us a way out through the ark which is now Christ by believing in Christ. You can make that trade with him, your sin for his righteousness. Simply just by confessing faith in Christ, repenting of your sin. I'd like you to take a few moments just to meditate over these things.